the Virginia Horse Industry Board, Southwest Virginia Agricultural Association, and the Virginia Christmas Tree Growers Association are proud sponsors of Virginia Farming. This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Large or small, Virginia farmers work year-round to help put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Brought to you by Farm Family. Life, auto, business, farm. Jim Gray, farmer's son, agribusiness owner, insurance agent. Another personal story on farmfamilypeople.com. Farm Family, the people you know. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. One of Virginia's own was recently elected national FFA president. Brian Walsh joins us on Ag Insights. Then we'll talk about getting the most out of peonies when we join Mark Viette in the garden. Plus, we'll have the Ag Calendar, a Minute in the Field video, and the Ag News of the Week, all on this edition of Virginia Farming. After months and months of deliberation, President Obama signed the Farm Bill last week. Farm Bureau reports that the bill includes many provisions that will benefit Virginians, including strengthened crop insurance for farmers and conservation programs to help protect the Chesapeake Bay. Virginia's General Assembly has also passed House Bill 71 and its Senate counterpart. Now, you may remember this bill was a topic of discussion on our show a few weeks ago. The bill sets out to protect Virginia's small farmers and the rural way of life. Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe has awarded two planning grants from the Agriculture and Forestry Industries Development Fund, also known as AFID. The two projects, one in Essex County and the other a partnership effort between the town of Percival and Loudoun County, have been awarded a total of $34,500 to support the growth of agriculture and forestry projects in the Commonwealth. The AFID planning grant program, funded annually at $250,000, encourages local governments to promote agriculture and forestry and incorporate the needs of those important industries into their economic development planning efforts. Well, Lauren Arbogast of Rockingham County has been named Virginia's Agriculture in the Classroom Teacher of the Year. The award recognizes a Virginia educator for efforts in incorporating agriculture into his or her core curriculum. Now, Arbogast teaches a preschool at Keister Elementary School in Harrisonburg and integrates agriculture into not only her own classroom, but also the entire school. She established a Farming in the City Day to increase student awareness of agriculture and has participated in several AITC professional development events. Now, if she looks familiar, well, you've seen her on Virginia Farming before in a story by Lonnie Furbank. Some preschoolers believe that the milk they drink simply comes from the grocery store. Here in Harrisonburg City, we are really just kind of footsteps removed from the farm or, or one step away from the farm. We're surrounded by Rockingham County, which is a lot of um, rural, it's a rural area, um, lots of farms. However, the children here in the city a lot of them don't realize that. So Mrs. Arbogast makes sure her class at Keister Elementary School takes the time to learn where their food really comes from. So um, a few weeks ago we had a local dairy farmer come in and just share with us about her life on a dairy farm and in contrast to life in the city. And um, then we were able to go out and see a cow, touch a cow. Um, and for a lot of the kids that was, hu that was huge. <laughs> being able to see this thing that was high above them, you know, and they were looking up and we were explaining, you know, there's the udder and that's where the milk comes out. And um, the upper grades that joined us also were able to use some like dairy economics lessons as pre and post work. This activity was just one installment of Farm Friday. Farm Friday lessons are something that I tie into our general, our general preschool theme or curriculum or a concept that we're teaching, a literacy concept or a math concept. For example, patterning, you can do patterning with um, an, an aspect of agriculture, like for example, apples. And then you, have, you can do just a quick two minute lesson on an apple orchard and like from seed 
to grocery store and just to give the children background and how it really works. But Friday isn't the only time these students learn about farming. Daily we talk about what's on their, their cafeteria tray, their tray from the cafeteria and you know where the different things come from. Um, and so after about two weeks to a month of doing this, you see them start to stop and process. You get some interesting questions out of that. You know, once we figured out where milk come from, I had a child ask me if hamburger came out the same way too. To expand these lessons beyond her own classroom, Mrs. Arbogast is working with an instructional coach to integrate lessons into curriculums for all grade levels. There are demands on teachers um, today that just absolutely were never there before. Mm -hmm. And they have very strong curriculum and SOL guides that they're following, and they care about every child's emotional growth, and they want it to be fun. So there's a never-ending list right. for a teacher. And what we're trying to do is be able to supply them ways that given all those things on their plate, that we can do an overlay that allows agriculture to be there too. Example would be in the fourth grade curriculum when they're teaching Virginia studies, one of a piece of Virginia studies are Virginia products. Perfect tie-in. And last year, Mrs. Arbogast and Mrs. Studwell gave students at Keister a chance to experience farm life. And then at the end of the year, we have um, a Farming in the City event, which our inaugural one was last year. Um, and we had over 720 children here and about 1,000 people as far as, you know, once we added in staff and volunteers and farmers. <laughs> the children got to get hands on and, you know, get on a tractor and talk to local farmers and milk a fake cow and all these just different aspects of agriculture so that they could see just a little peek into the farm. Through these activities, they hope to get students thinking about the career opportunities agriculture has to offer. We're not setting up a career opportunity day, but what we are trying to make sure is that all our children can identify this, just like they say, oh, I want to be a policeman, I want to be a fireman, which children say all the time. We want them to add to their list, I want to be a farmer. For Virginia Farming, I'm Lonnie Furbank. Thanks, Lonnie. Mrs. Arbogast will receive a scholarship to attend the 2014 National Agriculture in the Classroom Conference in June in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and will be encouraged to apply for the National Agriculture in the Classroom Teacher of the Year recognition. The American Farm Bureau Federation is working with the Farmer Veteran Coalition to find jobs for military members transitioning back into civilian life. AFBF President Bob Stallman says he's optimistic returning veterans will learn how to continue their service to our country by helping feed its citizens, nourish its land, and make its rural communities more viable. The two organizations have released a resource guide which outlines how to participate in the new partnership. They're also looking to help train beginning farmers and make equipment available to veteran farmers. While only 17% of the country calls rural communities home, 44% of military recruits come from rural America. Well, when it comes to raising high quality beef, every decision matters. In this segment, we hear from a meat scientist about the impact cow herd nutrition has on carcass quality of future progeny. BJ Scott has more. Talk about the best of both worlds. Early fetal programming work shows that cow herd management could increase marbling while reducing back fat in calves. Meat scientists recently looked at cow nutrition during mid-gestation, a critical time for fetal muscle and marbling development. South Dakota State University's Amanda Blair isn't ready to give blanket recommendations just yet, but says the results are encouraging. We've seen that um Calves were born to cows that, that were in a negative energy status during gestation, uh, had improved yield grades, and also uh, had improved what we call marbling ratios, where they had more marbling in relation to subcutaneous or back fat, which is a favorable distribution if, if you look at the dynamics of the industry. We're wanting to improve quality grade by increasing marbling and, and dropping that yield grade down. So um, that, that marbling ratio was a, an interesting uh, result that we found uh, from this work. There was no difference in meat appearance or other traits, like tenderness. 
When producers hear a lot of this work on fetal programming, I think it makes sense because, you know, we can understand it from the human side. We've, we've heard things, you know, like pregnant women aren't supposed to drink or smoke and they need to eat healthy. So it makes sense that, that what's going on during gestation could have a, a long-term impact on the offspring. But I think we're really at the tip of the iceberg on finding out how to use this as a potential management tool, um, at, at least in regards to the research that we've been conducting on, on carcass merit. Previous Nebraska work shows that supplementation in the third trimester improves grading on harvested progeny and performance of retained heifer calves. That's proof that more study is needed to fine-tune guidelines, Blair says. It's, it's an interesting area of research and uh, lends itself to a lot of follow-up studies. I'm B.J. Scott. Thanks, B.J. Future Farmers of America was founded in 1928 and has brought together students, teachers, and agribusinesses to solidify support for agricultural education. National FFA President, Virginia's own Brian Walsh joins us. That's straight ahead on Ag Insights. Another honor for another Virginian. Brian Walsh was recently elected National FFA President. Brian, welcome to Virginia Farming. Thanks so much for having me. Congratulations on your new position. Um, give us some background about yourself. Yeah, so I was actually born in Leesburg, Virginia, and as many of us know, it's a little bit more urban setting than Shenandoah County or Rockingham right. County. Uh, I moved to Shenandoah County when I was in sixth grade and was a member of 4-H, uh, showed livestock, hogs, and lambs uh, at our local county fair for a number of years. Uh, I went to Central High School, and from there, that's when I got involved uh, with FFA uh, and continued that throughout high school developed some uh, great skills through FFA and uh, actually developed a supervised agriculture experience in which I started raising livestock to show to or to sell to other uh, 4-H and FFA members to show and sell. Um, so from there that operation kind of grew, kind of developed a passion for agriculture uh, in my heart that's near and dear. We don't have a connection in my family to agriculture whatsoever so to kind of build that is, is kind of a unique opportunity. Well, I think that's really unique that our national FFA president doesn't have that much of an agricultural background. So kudos to you. That's great. Well, thank you. So how old are you? I'm 21. I actually just turned 21. Okay. So where are you with school? You were attending college. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I'm uh, currently a sophomore at Virginia Tech majoring in agribusiness uh, with a minor in leadership and social change. Uh, so actually, after I was elected to national office, I had a couple weeks to wrap up my studies at Virginia Tech and we'll be taking the next year uh, off from school to serve the National FFA organization and I'll return in 2015 uh, to Virginia Tech. And you'll return in the middle of your sophomore year. Yep, so I'm like a <laughs> sophomore and a half right now. So. That's pretty amazing. I don't think a lot of people realize that you guys really do have to take a year off of school to basically serve in this capacity. And I, I think it's great that you're willing to do that. Yeah, absolutely. It's a busy schedule for the next uh, 365 days, uh, but it's one that's worth it. Well, I know, you've, I know you do have a busy schedule. I want to know what some of your requirements were what did you have to do to be one of those who was nominated for president? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the way it works is each state across the country has the opportunity to nominate one person. Uh, so I ran for the spot in Virginia against three other people and was selected as Virginia's candidate for national office. And then at our National FFA convention, which was held in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, back in October, I had the opportunity to run against 42 other folks representing their respective states from across the country. Um, and then six of us were elected to the National Officer Team on the last day of our convention. And those six are the people that I'll be serving with uh, over the course of the next year. That's amazing. Share with me a little bit, what was it like when you found out that you were elected president? Oh my gosh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things you can't really put into words, um, but you're, you're overjoyed by the excitement and the way they do is they uh, announce the state first and then the person, and I think I heard uh, the first part of Virginia, the ver, uh, luckily, there wasn't a Vermont or anything because <laughs> I, I would have been, uh, you know, a little bit confused. Uh, but, you know, I jumped out of my seats and ran up to the stage and it was just overwhelmed with excitement and, and excitement to, to, to serve this year and, and to do what I've, uh, you know, came here to do. Right. Well, I think we spoke to you um, last year at the Virginia Convention and you seemed very excited then. So I was really excited to hear that, that you had gotten this position that's great Absolutely. so share with us some things that you've done you've only been in office for about three months or so yeah. share with us some things you've done so far 
Yeah, so we were elected back on November 2nd, and uh, right after convention, we went to uh, Indiana and had a little bit of training uh, for the coming year, some uh, team training, kind of developing that bond between our team so that we can go out as a team and serve the organization over the next year. Uh, afterwards, we came back in December uh, after some time at home and went to Tyson's headquarters in Northwest Arkansas had the opportunity to do some speech development uh, to kind of create and develop and work on those speeches that we'll be giving over the course of the next year. Uh, we also worked on workshops a lot uh, while we traveled to state FFA conventions and to uh, different places across the country over the course of the next year. We'll have the opportunity to present to students about leadership uh, and about service and kind of share those messages that we want to share personally. Uh, so we have the opportunity to work on this, develop and grow uh, as a team. And then uh, actually in January, I had the opportunity to represent the national organization at a board of directors meeting, and then went to Japan for about 10 days and actually just got back from Japan. Uh, and then the rest of the year will be spent traveling to state FFA conventions, representing the National FFA organization at different agricultural uh, meetings, and kind of serving this organization for the students that, that we represent. Well, you talk about representing the national organization of FFA. What is your mission? What is the FFA mission? Yeah, well, the FFA mission is uh, FFA makes a positive difference in the lives of students by developing their potential for premier leadership, personal growth, and career success through agriculture education. So we're preparing students uh, for that next step in the agriculture industry, preparing the next generation of leaders, uh, and allowing our students to grow personally to become the best them that they can be. It sounds like a, it sounds like <laughs> a lot of fun, Absolutely. and I know you guys have a lot of fun when you're together because I've seen this big group of Blue Jackets get together, and you guys have a blast. Oh yeah! Every time we're in Louisville or, or Indiana, it's a it's a sea of Blue Jackets everywhere we go. <laughs> I'm sure. Well, what about personally? Do you have a personal goal, something that you really want to either get out of this or give? out of yeah. this? Absolutely. That's, um, you know, that's something that in, in the process of interviewing and in the process of developing as a candidate, you really think about a lot. And I remember, you know, as a, as a student, I always looked up to national officers and state officers and, and was in awe, you know, all oh, these people are so cool. And then you're in the position and you realize that you're just another normal person. You know, I'm just a normal guy from Woodstock, Virginia, uh, that, that loves the same things as, as everybody else does. And I think that if I can give anything uh, over the next year, it's, it's about inserting and, and allowing students to realize that no matter what background we come from, no matter you know, whether or not we're tied to the agriculture industry, no matter uh, you know, what economic status we come from, we can develop that passion for whatever we're passionate about and carry that through to do great things. And I look back at, at my career as an FFA member, and it's because of some great mentors, it's because of some great teachers, and it's because of the opportunities that I was able to seize, um, that I was able to develop that passion and carry that out. No matter who you are, no matter what you do, we can all do that. That's great. Well, what do you see personally as the biggest challenge that's facing agriculture as a whole today? Oh, um, <laughs> I, I, you know, coming from a... If you can pick just one. <laughs> well, there's obviously, uh, you know, a few issues that we're facing now. Um, but I think for me, you know, I would boil it down to, and this is kind of coming from the, the agriculture education background that I come from, you know, interacting with a lot of different students and consumers across the country, you know, over the last couple months uh, and, and continuing to do so. You know, I see a, a need to be able to unite behind a common message. And I think that, you know, within agriculture, as agriculture diversifies and as it grows and as it becomes more unique, we tend to stray away from, from a core message that we can convey to consumers. And I think that when we can stand behind and unite behind that one common message, that core mission of what agriculture is and what it's meant to do for people, then we'll be a lot more powerful in conveying our story and our message to the world. Great. Well, what is your message to young people who may be interested in getting into farming or any other realm of agriculture at this point? Uh -huh. I think, uh, you know, for me, it, it goes back to my personal experiences of, of raising those hogs and those lambs uh, for the county fair. And I think, you know, my message would be to start small. You know, so many times uh, today we have people that are interested but don't know where to start. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, when we start small, we kind of develop that passion and slowly uh, begin to learn and grow 
about what we're passionate about and to uh, kind of develop those skills and that knowledge that's going to be useful in the future. So I think when we can start small, we can develop that passion on a small level, allow others to feed us with knowledge and allow uh, others to, to fuel us with that passion, then that's when we can grow through those experiences, develop that passion, uh, and then be able to do that in a larger scale. So for me, you know, I took that, uh, that that small scale agriculture of raising hogs and lambs and one day hope to be a part of the agriculture industry in a much larger picture. Um, so I think we can start small and grow that uh, much bigger, develop that knowledge and, and take in those skills and that's when we're going to be successful. I agree. I think you're right. Well you mentioned something about being part of the agricultural industry. Mm -hmm. So when your presidency is over, you go back to your, the middle of your sophomore yep. year at Virginia Tech. <laughs> What's next for Brian Walsh? What's after, what's after tech? Oh, well, uh, after tech, I hope to you know, maybe come back to Woodstock, Virginia, and I would like to teach for a couple years. Uh, the, the impact that my agriculture teachers, both of them, have had on me is, is absolutely extraordinary. And I want to be able to convey that uh, to students in, in the classroom after I graduate. I uh, hope to teach for maybe 10 years or so, and then go to you know, some other capacity within maybe helping uh, Virginia FFA to grow uh, what we do here at the state level, uh, maybe work in a lobbying job uh, somewhere in, in the United States, you know, kind of lobbying for agriculture, uh, but definitely want to be a part of the agriculture industry, definitely want to have uh, some small scale agriculture back at home uh, to raise some animals and raise a family and have some fun. <laughs> Well, you know what? I just I'm I know you're going to be successful no matter what you decide to do because you're very well spoken and I think you represent Virginia and FFA very well. Thank you so, so much. So, thank you so much for being here, Brian. Thank we you. appreciate it. Thanks. We'll be right back. Peonies are a springtime favorite with their wonderful fragrance and lush green foliage. With tips on getting the most out of your peonies, here's Mark Viette. Peonies love full sun. The leading reason peonies don't bloom for people is they plant them in full sun and then they plant a couple trees. A few years later, the trees are completely shading peonies. At least give peonies all afternoon day sun from like 12 o'clock in the afternoon through evening. That'll help them bloom better for you. One of my favorite peonies is Gay Paris. It's an anemone type, not fully double like this, so Gay Paris, even in the heavy rains, doesn't fall over. I hate staking plants. It, it's a lot of waste of time, I think, unless it's a very cherished plant that you have. Peonies have been grown in the U.S. since 1757, so I consider them an heirloom plant or an old-fashioned plant, they'll live for 100, 150 years, really don't need to do anything. Just uh, cut them down to the ground every fall, probably in August or September. I just trim them right to the ground. Now this is the garden or herbaceous peony. And the other thing I want you to keep in mind is if you do want to share that heirloom plant with one of your friends, you can dig a portion of this plant, like a quarter of it, in September or October, fill back in the area you dug from the ground, and give your friend that favorite plant so they can enjoy it for another 50 or 100 years. Tree peonies are really beautiful, almost crepe paper like flowers. This is a plant you do not cut back. You can cut off the old flowers, but if you cut any further down this stem, you'll either kill a plant or it will never flower for you in the future. I enjoy growing new plants, and one of the things that really has been great in the garden is a hybrid between the garden peony and the tree peony, which are called Ito peonies. And look at the beautiful yellow flower that we have here. Remember, peonies are long lived, they're fun, everyone should have them in the garden. I'm Mark Viette, join me next time in the garden. Taking a look at the Ag Calendar, the Virginia Agriculture Leaders Obtaining Results, or VALOR program, has opened the application process for its second cohort of fellows this fall. For more information, visit valor.aee.vt.edu or contact Megan Seibel. That does it for our show. Thanks for watching and have a great week. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming.
This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. From apples to zucchini, Virginia farmers work hard to put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Brought to you by Farm Family. Life, auto, business, farm. Nancy Asher, stable owner, visionary, agent of change. Another personal story on farmfamilypeople.com. Farm Family, the people you know.